Helen May in Bell, California. I understand it's your birthday, so happy birthday. Uh, Baron in York, Pennsylvania. Ken in Frederick, Maryland. Roy in Lebanon, Tennessee. Dick in Corona, Del Mar. John, Archie, Tom, Terry, Richard, Peter, all of you who are here, we thank you all. Uh, I want to get on with some of the content of this, and, but I appreciate all of you uh, uh, supporting authors coming in, because it takes that for the publishers to send them. Uh, here are kind of two quick questions I want to just kind of quickly go into. Um, let's see, what is your opinion, uh, I guess to you, Jason, of the fee of the female lawyer who led the effort, uh, the effort, I'm sorry, to get Mary Lincoln out of the asylum only after three months of treatment. I think that was Myra. Myra Bradwell. She was an amazing woman. She was uh, an abolitionist, um, feminist. Uh, she was, um, you know, one of the first women. Uh, she passed the bar, although the eventually the United States Supreme Court did not allow her to practice because she was a married woman. But. Um, one thing I discovered, uh, you know, she's gone down as history as the woman who got Mary out. One thing I, I personally believe uh, is that Mary actually got herself out, and but she enlisted Myra Bradwell as her very willing and able accomplice, as was James Bradwell. You know, Myra Bradwell, she was very interesting. Um, she deserves a book. There's only been one book about her. It's a book of essays written by a lawyer focused more on Myra Bradwell's work on the Chicago Legal News and doing other legal things. So I would love uh, somebody, that would be a great book, to do just a straight out biography of Myra Bradwell because she was a very big personality in her day. Yeah, well, the first female lawyer, as you said, here in Illinois. I had right. to sue for that. Supreme Court denied it, of the federal Supreme Court, and had to come back here and yeah. finally got And yet, that. what I love is that, so then she published the Chicago Legal News, which became yeah. the most um, with the widest circulation, the most read legal newsletter in America by all the men who wouldn't let her practice. <laughs> but they took her <laughs> advice, which I think is great. Uh, kind of a quick one here, because um, I've been to Robert and Mary Harlan's tomb, and it is the best place in the solar system to spend eternity. It's, in, it's on, a, on the, in, in Arlington Cemetery, going up the hill, uh, if you're at the Kennedy grave and look to the right, uh, it's down a piece, but you can find it there. It's a little knoll outcropping, wonderful trees to shade and overlooking all of Washington, D.C. Uh, and so Dan in Beaver Dam uh, asks uh, what that the recent scholarship has revealed that Mary Harlan mm -hmm. made that decision. Uh, Robert intended to be in Springfield, right. but she made the decision mm -hmm. afterward to move both of them to um, to uh, Washington. Yes. Uh, so this was her decision. Yeah, and not even at first. Yeah, when Robert died, he expected to be buried in the Lincoln tomb. When he died, Mary Harlan Lincoln wrote to the I think it was the Secretary of State of Illinois to prepare, and he wrote to her to prepare in the uh, in the summer to move Robert's body from Manchester to Washington. And then after she wrote a wonderful letter uh, that was found by uh, Donna McCreary, who's written a number of wonderful books herself, um, this letter said that uh, Mary Harlan Lincoln was a, a Christian uh, scientist, and she said that after, I think she said a week or numerous days of thoughtful prayer at Hill Dean, so this was after Robert was dead, she'd already started the wheels turning to go to, to, go to Springfield. She said, after many days of thoughtful prayer, I have realized that our darling, uh, her husband, he was his own great man, and he deserves his own place in the sun, separate from his illustrious father. And so I'm going to bury him in Arlington. And there was quite an outcry. Uh, the people of Illinois, the, the government of the state of Illinois, very briefly looked into it to see if she could do that. Then when she uh, had her son Abraham Lincoln the second Jack exhumed, they also investigated to see if she could legally do that, take him out of the state and move him to Arlington, which they said she could. Not that they would fight the descendant of Abraham Lincoln's son, but or the wife of his son. But yeah, that was her her decision, and uh, you know I think she was very at peace with it, even though a lot of people got upset. And uh, I don't know how Robert would have felt about it. I you know he fully intended to be buried there, um, but it had nothing to do with the fact that Mary Harlan did not want to spend eternity next to Mary Todd, which I hear that a lot. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> but I think. Uh... 
she and you have both uh, allowed Robert to have a image of his own now. I think yeah, it's a very I, important book in that regard. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm not going to not say that about yours, Ken, because <laughs> I think people should read these two together because they do allied. I mean, when I read one and then one read the other, I said, boy, these are, you know, I'm glad I have the two of them together <laughs> on here because this is on many of the same subjects and same people and they're all in each one. So I think it's one of those that uh, does best for both to have the other read as well. I, how was Robert as a speaker? He, he didn't, didn't like to speak. Didn't like it. He did not like it at all. He would. Um, from all the coverage I've read in newspapers, he, he spoke for every presidential candidate, Republican candidate, from 1876 up to 1900, I believe. I think McKinley's re-election was the last time he spoke. Um, and yeah, he spoke for, I think it was uh, for Garfield in 1880, Roberts spoke all over the Midwest. In, I think in, in 12 days, he spoke in about 20 different cities to 5, 10, 20,000 people at a time. And of all the coverage was, wow, he's a chip off the old block. That's a great, whenever talk about Robert, all the newspapers always said, he's a chip off the old block. Um, but I don't know, you know, that could be a little uh, <coughs> hero worship adulation of the son of Lincoln. But as far as I can tell, he was a good speaker. Well, I think he was a chip off the old block because his father didn't like to speak right. either. <laughs> he always said he got nervous before speaking. Yeah. And I understand that. <laughs> we all do. Uh, as president, of course, he was afraid of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Hence his brevity on most occasions. And we don't appreciate that the annual message was not delivered orally to Congress. It was just written. So those long speeches, he didn't have to stand up in front of an audience to <laughs> recite. Um, he gave so many speeches, if you look at his collected works, that are speeches explaining why he's not going to speak. Yep. And that's how he filled that empty space where he was afraid that he might say the wrong thing. And certainly in the context of the Civil War, saying the wrong thing could be very, very dangerous. Yeah, Harold Holzer wrote a wonderful article called I Should Not Say Foolish Things, uh, all about Lincoln's speeches saying why he shouldn't make a speech. Yes. Well, I had a hand in getting a recent um, uh, standing Lincoln, the George Barnard Lincoln. Let me see if I can hold this well so you can see it. And this actually uh, is the one from Penn State that came off the mold. Now, the, George Barnard uh, had a commission uh, from William Howard Taft's brother to uh, get up a statue of Lincoln uh, in, in Cincinnati. And uh, he did it. And Robert was looking over his shoulder and was pretty unhappy with the image that came out mm -hmm. and tried to stop it. This is what Barnard came up with. This is uh, a good rendition of what the larger statue looks like. And to me, that's the animal himself. But <laughs> it's a different time. Uh, he was certainly, as you've mentioned before, he was his hand in the legacy of his father. Um, how do you think about this? Uh, the, the burning of whatever letters and papers were burned. Uh, stopping, trying to stop this sort of uh, terrible image of his father to his eyes come out. Was he hindering or delaying historical research and did he win in the end? It doesn't seem so. I don't think he was trying to hinder. Um, he, he never burned any papers that had public value. He only burned things that he thought were too private. private for, so, you know, I was saying before we started here that um, we know Mary Lincoln had a little box full of love letters. <clears throat> between her and her husband, those letters do not exist anymore. I'm convinced Robert burned those because to him, that is not fit for public consumption between his parents. But did he want, mm. did he want his father to be a marble man at, like Washington was at um, then and even today? Is that how he intended to have him go into history? I don't think he, he meant, to, um, meant to make it that perfect to whitewash it. But I, I think he wanted to stick with the truth. But to him, the truth was kind of the whitewashed version. No. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, you know, all well, of his father's reality papers... reality may transcend the truth. Right. But all of his father's papers, um, 
Robert did not have those in his possession for about 50 years, which I found, I didn't realize that. Um, they were in with David Davis, then they were with John Nicolay, then with John Hay. And Robert kept saying, I need to go through these and, and you know, uh, f comb through them and get rid of what's not necessary. And Nicolay said, don't touch anything until I look at it, which Robert didn't do. So um, Nicolay and Hay, when they looked through the papers, they looked through everything. Robert didn't touch them. So if there was anything of importance in there uh, that Robert burned, which he didn't, but even if he did, Nicolay and Hay would have used it. But well, no. But they were, he was looking over their shoulders too. Yes and no. Um, the, if you read all of the letters about when they wrote the book, mm -hmm. the snippets that are used in other people's books, they really don't give the full story. Nicolay and Hay wrote their book. They asked Robert to proofread it. He said, I don't want to proofread. I don't, I don't proofread stuff about my father. I trust you. They said, no, no, we want to make sure this is right for you. So Robert read through it, and then he did try to clean it up. You know, Hay hammered on Thomas Lincoln. And Robert said, you know, this is not fair. He didn't have time to prepare himself for his son's greatness, and I think we need to let up on the old boy. So, you know, the, the story that Abraham Lincoln and the crew of the boat sewed the eyelids shut of the pigs on the boat, Robert had them take that out because it was vulgar. It was a very disgusting story. <clears throat> Things like that. But, you know, and then, you know, there's a letter everybody cites where Hay says, you know, I just want to make sure, are you, are you okay with this? We can change this. And it, and it makes Robert sound like he's very, very seriously, heavily wielding a red pen. Robert's response is, hey, I trust you. I don't need to look at anything else. You do what you think is best. I trust you. Hay was being proactive mm -hmm. because Robert was not only his friend, but he was, you know, he gave them access to everything. Um, I have kind of two questions, almost uh, they're parallel, but they're some, somehow coming together for me. Uh, you say he regretted not writing about his dad, and uh, so do I. Yes, uh, I do too. So were there expectations from society on him that he might do that? Oh, what right. expectations were there that he felt maybe he would reveal too much of himself or him or, or, or the parents? Speak to this a little bit. He, um, and he, the expectations of society on Robert. Yeah, throughout his life, society, um, they kept asking him for books, for articles, for speeches. Um, and it was amazing. If you think of Robert's life, beginning in 1865 for the next... 60 plus years every single day he received letters in the mail can you write to this can you speak to this will you look at what i wrote will you look at what i painted will you look at what i sculpted will you look at what i every day and he answered every letter which is heroic in itself but no robert decided in 65 said i will leave it to others to talk about my father's legacy i will not comment and um you know that was and even when herndon said his most outrageous things robert never came out Sometimes he would go back alley and write to John Hay and say, hey, you know, you're the editor of a newspaper. Can you write an article about this? And to John Nicolay. There was a couple times where Robert was incensed by, um, was it when Charles Francis Adams wrote a book? Or no, he gave a eulogy and he said William Seward was the brains behind the Lincoln administration and Lincoln was an idiot. Robert was incensed and he wanted to write an article, say, I've got a letter right here that proves this false. And Nicolay said, no, don't do that because you're going to preempt our book. And you're going to hurt sales. Plus, you probably shouldn't do that. And so Robert and David Davis said, "Yes, don't do that." So Robert said, "Okay, I won't do that." So um, yeah, there was a lot of expectations, but he did not again want to um, insert himself into these things. Well, I think part of his uh, motive in trying to keep personal details personal and private was to shield his mother. Yes, I know definitely. that. After Herndon delivered his lectures in Springfield, they were published. Mm -hmm. Robert, Todd Lincoln, and David Davis spent four months shielding her. Yep. She had no knowledge for four months while the huge public outcry was going on. Mm -hmm. And at last she found out about the lectures mm -hmm. and read them. And then she wrote letters to the newspaper, which Herndon turned her words more or less around, which became a great embarrassment to her which is what Robert and Davis were trying to avoid. <laughs> and I think the advice not to go public in response was wise, mm. but it's something that Mary Lincoln did not, have the temp did not have the temperament to practice. Right. Well, I think we're going to have to wind down here, uh, and there's certainly a lot more. 
uh, the assassinations he was part of, etc. So appreciate very much for SIU getting the two of you here and appreciate your both being here. Thank all of you for being here as well. You can certainly come up and ask questions uh, afterward. And all of you out in Webland, thank you. Uh, you make this possible. And uh, don't forget June 2nd, but come back. If, you, if you've not sent us your email so you get announcements from us, please do that. Uh, but I presume you did because you're here now. <laughs>